Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. You're very welcome to the DCU National Center for Family Business. And you're very welcome today to our webinar on taking a step back, the importance of strategy for growing your family business. My name is Eric Clinton. I'm director of the NCFB. I'm mindful many of you join us today from the Isle of Ireland, both north and south. But I'm delighted to say we family businesses join us from right across Europe, from France, Germany, Spain, and Italy. And indeed, some of you will be listening to this in the podcast series uh, later on throughout the day and, and the weeks ahead. I'd particularly like to thank our partners, AIB, for continuing to back uh, the Family Business of Ireland and initiatives like this we're doing today. Before I tell you a little bit about the webinar and the purpose of today and introduce some of our keynote speakers, I want to talk to you a little bit about the 35th president of the United States of America, John F. Kennedy. And what were John F. Kennedy's thoughts on crises? And this is something Kennedy had to say. When, it, when written in Chinese, the word crisis is composed of two characters. One character represents danger and the other opportunity. And that's exactly what we're going to talk about today. How can we see opportunity during a time of crisis? Before I go further, I want to tell you a little bit about a company called Victorinox. And for maybe many of you on the call this morning, you're like, Eric, I've never heard of Victorinox. But I want to give you an example of a family business that's been faced with crisis. Victorinox was founded in 1894 by a gentleman called Carl Elsner. So at this stage, it's a 127 year old family business, multiple generations. What they're most famous for is the manufacturing of the Swiss army knife. Indeed, 95% of their sales, up to a major point of crisis in their family business, were selling the Swiss army knife. The Swiss army knife through the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, was given at big ceremonial points in people's lives, maybe at the turning of 18 years of age or 21, or maybe even at retirement. But what's the crisis? September 11th had a huge impact on the world, but had a huge impact on their family business. Why, you might ask? Particularly with airline travel, you could no longer carry knives, guns, or anything like that on an airplane. Within days, if not weeks, their family business was on the rocks. Sales declined in the US and sales declined right across Europe. So you're like, what do you do? You're the current generation. This is a multi-generational family business. You've got communities that are dependent on you. A lot of family businesses would have went into defensive, laying off staff, cost-cutting measures, downsizing. They didn't do this. They actually went in the offensives. And they saw a time of crisis as an opportunity to reinvent themselves, to reflect on their product offering, and dare say to develop a new product line. Today, if you look at Victorinox, 35% of their sales are in knives. 65% are in travel gear, fragrances, and watches. This is a resilient family business. This is a family business that saw an opportunity in a time of crisis. But this is not just one. This is a Swiss family business. I want to show you now in the following slide, family businesses across time. This is an amazing slide. And on the bottom right, it's, it's slow, it's small, but I'll share this with you in the future. This comes from the Family Business Index and it's colleagues of ours in, in St. Gallen University in Switzerland. And what you can see in the screen are times of crisis across the world and how a business has been born during this time of crisis or has radically changed its business operations or been reborn for many of these firms. The first one, maybe as you look and go, wow, look at that little red dot out in the way out in the left. That's a Japanese firm still in existence today, multi-billion dollar firm, the Takanaka Corporation of Japan. 1610, it was founded during the time of the Great Plague, 411 year old family business. Next over, you can see Merck is the green little dot, kind of a little bit over from that, a little bit younger and 353 years uh, out of Germany. And then we go through, you can see through the French Revolution, the, the cholera outbreak, the civil wars, the, the plague, the Russian flu, 
you know, Volkswagen, Exxon, Ford, Walmart. So I'd encourage you to maybe consider having a look at this, uh, the website. It's fantastic to see family businesses that saw crisis as an opportunity to reinvent uh, themselves. And that's largely what we're going to do today. We're going to talk to you through, we're going to introduce in, in a few minutes some family businesses who are on the front line. You're going to hear from some service providers who help these family business through, you know, opportunities, through times of crisis. And you're going to hear from some scholars who work with family businesses, both the current and next generation members of it. The first family I want to introduce you to is the Cantic Group. The Cantic Group is led by a brother and sister. So it's a sibling partnership. Uh, Greg Tuhi is the MD and Greg's sister, sister Aideen Carrick is the operations director. Uh, Greg is going to speak to us first and tell us about the Cantic Group and Greg's sister Aideen is going to join us later in the panel discussion. What I thought would be most insightful and relevant when we talk about the topic of strategy here today is the phenomenal growth over the last 10 years of the Cantic Group. Over the last 10 years, this family business has grown by more than 400% through a combination of two mergers, two acquisitions, and in Greg's own words, a lot of hard work. So I'm going to show you a short video now to explain a little bit about the Cantec Group. I'm going to ask Greg to, to join us and tell us a little bit about his family business. Cantec was established in Waterford in 1994 um, by our parents, actually, our mum and dad. So currently in the business family-wise, uh, just myself and Greg now, since our, our parents retired about five years ago, more than five years ago. Um, business-wise, it's been tough, but we're getting through it and diversification has been key for us. Yeah, I think the family business element has, has been key for us. I mean, we, we're brother and sister and obviously, um, you know, blood is thicker than water. So uh, we trust each other implicitly, <laughs> allegedly. It, it's great to see the country opening up again and uh, I'm feeling really optimistic as well um, and I think that we may have a repeat of what happened 100 years ago, uh, another Roaring Twenties, how exciting would that be? That would be cool. Good morning and thanks very much for that in introduction Eric. Wow, um, so listen this is great, uh, um, thanks a million for the opportunity to describe our story and describe a little bit about the strategy and the challenges we've had um, over, over the years. Um, so I suppose, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll talk a little bit, bit about myself and a bit about where uh, I came from, where the company came from. Um, so I'm going to use um, a few slides as, as visual aids, if you don't mind, specifically to, to remind me where, what I'm supposed to be talking about. Um, so um, myself, I grew up in Cork, um, I left school and I went to UCC and um, I went to um, study biochemistry uh, because I thought I was going to be a biochemist. Um, little did I know you, I actually had to go to a few lectures and, and maybe do a bit of studying uh, to become a, a science professor. Um, so um, I probably spent a little bit too much time hanging around the college bar and, and, and playing rugby, etc. So. Um, uh, I quickly realized that um, maybe biochemistry wasn't wasn't going to be for me. Um, so then I changed tack and I decided I was going to be a, a professional rugby player. Um, so you can you can see me there in the background um, with hair chasing after Alan Quinlan. Um, got, a, got a bit of a start with Munster back in the day. Um, and, you know, it was great while it lasted, but didn't 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 last too long. Um, so while I was you know, mucking about with college and rugby and that. Um, my parents actually up and left the family home. This is back in the mid nineties and went to Waterford to set up a family business. Um, so in 1994, our parents set up Cantec. Um, Cantec is, is a provider of, of managed print services. Um, and, you know, shortly after they set up, my dad started talking to me about, you know, why don't you, why don't you follow us down to Waterford and, and, and join the family business? Um, as you can imagine, a guy growing up in Cork, I was like, Waterford, are you, are you joking me? I'm not going to Waterford. Um, but he kept asking and he, he kept he kept at it. So I said, you know what, Dad, I'll, I'll, I'll give it a year. Let's see how we get on. So um, 20, what, five or six years later, I'm still here. Um, so there's my mom and dad. They set up the family business. Um, and I went to work for them in, in 1995. Um, and my sister, who you saw there earlier, joined shortly afterwards, a few years later. Um, so... 
I suppose strategy is very important, but um, regardless of how well thought of your strategy is, you've got to be able to change tack. You've got to be able to pivot when external factors hit you. So shortly after I started, you know, I was selling photocopiers, fax machines. And shortly after I started, um, the first digital revolution happened and took over the world and, and everything we were selling became digital. So I had to learn how to, um, you know, install a machine on a, on a computer network, which is completely alien to me. I'd never used computers in college. Um, I was just um, a, a copier sales guy. Um, I had to learn what the difference between the internet and an, e and an email was. It was it was that serious back then. Um, but I did that and uh, I became quite good at what I was doing. Um, the, the business became quite successful. We were selling a lot of photocopiers, multifunctional printers, and we built our business up gradually to become quite a decent managed print provider over the years um, with my mum and dad at the helm and, and myself and my sister, Aideen, working closely with them. Um, but all the while, um, you know, we were battling with the whole concept of the, the paperless office, as you can see there. Um, you know, our business, uh, the businesses we were dealing with were always trying to cut down on the use of paper, trying to organize themselves a bit better. Um, and also the issue of sustainability was becoming more and more key, the environment and, you know, printing, photocopying. It's inherently a, a, an unsustainable practice um, and it's not that particularly efficient either. Um, so while, you know, our business is based on the amount that people print, um, we needed to think and think hard about how we were going to, you know, strategize and how we were going to build our business into the future. Um, and this really came to a point for me when we um, did a managed print a tender for UCC, where, where I had been 20 years previous. Um, um, so we actually won that tender on the basis of our sustain our sustainable practices and sustainability. And um, we installed remanufactured printers, um, which cut down on the carbon footprint of each device by 80%, which was huge for UCC. UCC is is renowned around the world as a, a green campus for their sustainability initiatives. So we won that tender based on, on sustainability, which, which is great for us. Um, so I remember one day I was talking to the uh, energy manager in UCC. Um, he pulled up in his, in his Nissan Leaf, got out and we were talking about printing and um, uh, printing habits around, around the campus, around the, the staff of UCC. And he said, I asked him, for example, Pat, you know, how much do you print? And he said, um, well, I don't print at all. And I'm like, you don't print at all? And um, he said, yeah, I haven't printed a document in over five years. And he was like, oh my God, we could be in a little bit of trouble here. Um, so at that point, um, it, it, that really drove home to me the whole um, change in our business, the threat to our business, you know, our lifeblood was, was our customers and, and, and the printing, the volume that they would print. Um, so I suppose um, we had a choice. We had to either bury our heads in the sand like a lot of our competitors were and just ignore the fact that people were trying to print less um, or else we could um, embrace that change in our industry. And if you like, be like turkeys voting for Christmas. So that's what we did. We actively began to encourage our customers to print less um, and to adopt more sustainable practices to share information. And we began to sell software automation solutions. Um, and um, why we thought this pro the process of moving away from from printing an unsustainable practice was was going to take you know a good few years. Then of course the whole world was turned upside down first by Brexit and but then of course by the by the pandemic um, and as you can imagine um, lots of people working from home lots of offices almost empty and um, printers turned off in the corner so there hasn't been an awful lot of printing done over the last 12 months and um, so we've had to um, pivot and, and pivot dramatically um, in order to sustain our business um, but luckily for us um, I had met a couple of likely lads from Cork um, 
about 18 months ago, who had just left one of our competitors, in fact, to set up their own smart, um, their own smart software business. They call it smart office technology. And their raison d'etre, if you like, was to simplify the way people work, to um, install, to implement automate, auto, automated software solutions to just simplify the way people work. For example, uh, the automation of the accounts payable process, which, which every company uh, has, um, is, it was one of their, their key products. So we, we began to collaborate with Smart Office um, a couple of years ago, and things went very well for us. So as you can imagine, our, our, our core is, is still managed print, photocopiers, printers, multifunctional machines. Um, but um, as the volumes are reducing, little by little, and quite dramatically over the, over the last year, we have um, put more focus on automated, automation solutions, particularly uh, through the collaboration with Smart Office. And things have gone really well. We have a really loyal base of customers up and down the country. Um, and the story we were telling them about automating their business processes has really uh, rung through to them. And uh, they've been quite prepared to listen to us and, and to, take, to take on some of the products that we're offering. So things went so well that we actually merged the two companies um, just before Christmas, about six months ago. Um, so what we did was we merged the companies and we created a Cantec group. Um, so the Cantec group now consists of three businesses within the group. So DocuTech is our traditional managed print business, which is still very strong. Um, Smart Office then, of course, is the software automation business. And one of the key products that we produced um, was a um, clearance tech, which is a customs clearance automation piece. So as you can imagine with Brexit, um, there's a lot more to be done in terms of customs clearance. So we've produced um, a piece of automation software, which makes that a lot easier. Then the third leg of the stool, if you like, is Promotive. And that's our marketing agency, um, which was always there within within Cantec, but it's, we've now uh, turned it into a, a business, business in its own right. Um, so I suppose... Um, Myself and, and Aideen, we, we took over from our parents in 2011 when, when they retired. And uh, it's been, as Eric said, it's been a quite dramatic for us, a lot of growth over those 10 years. And we've put a lot of work into strategy. Um, but my key message today, I suppose, is, you know, regardless of how well thought out your strategies are, you've got to be able to change. You've got to be able to change tack when, when something dramatic happens to your business, to your industry. Um, to the economy or, or to, to the world on a global scale, which we've all um, endured in the last year. And I think we've been pretty good at that. Um, it's possibly been easier because um, at the helm is myself and my sister. We trust each other and we get on really well. And I suppose that's probably made things easier for us. Um, but being able to pivot, being able to change direction, um, for various reasons has been very important to us and has, um, has seen us through. Greg, fascinating conversation. Just writing down some notes here. I think um, we have an opportunity to, to speak with, with Greg uh, and Aideen later on in a panel discussion, but some things that come when, I, when I'm thinking about this family business is, you know, first is a sibling partnership. So for a lot of people on the call this morning, it's how to, to work with, with a sibling. Uh, you've gone through a succession process, you talk about resilient and resilient behavior since you know joining your family business there's been lots of moments of shock uh crises in your family business whether it's digitalization brexit um and then obviously the pandemic of, of recently trust um and then i think which is very interesting and, and i could probably talk maybe it's over a pint or something but the sportsman mentality so being a sportsman and or a woman in and how that mindset shifts into it into a business context. So fascinating insights, Greg. Thank you very much for, for sharing uh, your story with us. Our second speaker is somebody who's worked with family businesses the length and breadth of this country. Uh, our second speaker is Rob Warnock. Uh, Rob is head of SME strategy and propositions at AIB. So Rob is working, as I said, with family businesses, both in product and service development. His particular area of focus is on SME and retail banking. 
uh, SME innovation and transformation, external market engagement, and supporting family businesses like you on the call today with new product and new service development. He's going to share his insights around strategy, uh, particularly from the bank's perspective, and also then from working with uh, family business across the country. Rob, you're really welcome, and thank you for sharing your story. Thanks, Eric. Um, hello, everyone. Um, as Eric said, I'm Rob. Uh, I'm responsible for SME strategy and propositions in AIB. I'm really delighted to be part of the panel discussion today, share with you my experiences, particularly, I'd say, over the last 15 months. Um, we've seen intense changes in the market, major shifts, and, and our customer needs and behaviours have really, really uh, changed over that period. Just in, in preparation for this morning, I'd, I'd like to say the first and obvious change has been that accelerated adoption of digital capability by businesses. And that adoption is very, very much here to stay, even post lockdowns. I suppose we've seen a lot of businesses being able to move at pace into having digital sales and support sites of their own. And in very many cases, these sales avenues have been their lifeline. And many customers are telling us with regard to future business models, um, that's really how they're going to move forward, even when the, the economy is once again fully open. Um, even when I say that, I suppose one customer springs to mind operating in, in the luxury goods sector and, and their business really came to a halt uh, last year. Uh, until they invested in maximizing their online presence and, and they also invested in a try before you buy technology and delighted to say their sales are now at higher levels even before the pandemic. But I also recognize that that type of, of step change and shift isn't always transferable to all types of businesses and all types of sectors. But it's still important, I suppose, to uh, think about adaptability and think about how the market dynamic is changing as we move forward uh, post the COVID pandemic. From an AIB perspective, and I suppose how events since March 2020 have influenced our strategy, um, if I'm being really honest, I'd have to start by saying at the beginning, we were just very much reacting to the fallout. Um, you know, we were firefighting, um, and I don't think firefighting and, and strategy are two uh, terms or words that should uh, or often go together, but we were reacting to the fallout, and our focus was on delivering payment breaks at, at an accelerated pace and also trying to streamline um, our cash flow solutions um, at a pace so that our customers uh, could engage with the bank, it could be seamless, it could be transparent, transparent. Um, but it was very, very relentless. And I suppose while we div delivered these solutions and we were able to leverage online channels and digital capability to try and make it as seamless and stress-free as possible for our customers, um, it was a really, really, really difficult period for, for, for many of us. I suppose um, in terms of the digital capability, just like um, what Greg spoke of early, earlier, we were able to leverage uh, some capability to, that was available in our market, which essentially enabled our customers to move away from paper um, at a time when I suppose people weren't necessarily had access to printers, uh, you know, going to the post office um, uh, to buy postage stamps, um, et cetera, et cetera. All that was, was kind of in a, in a period of, of pause. So the ability to kind of provide customers with documentation in a digital um, and automated manner was a real step change from the tr traditional approach that we'd been accustomed to down down through the many years. So eliminating the need for wet signatures was, was a really uh, important kind of step change in, in our ability to deliver um, solutions to our customers. And that really resonated with our business customers as well. I suppose on a personal level, the initial months of COVID, um, as I said, really felt like it, there was a constant firefight. And I suppose many times I found it very personally to, uh, you know, be able to switch off. Um, my wife and I had welcomed our first baby um, at the very start of the pandemic. And all of a sudden, I was now working from home on top of them. Uh, so like many people here today, there was a very different and, and, and a very unfamiliar uh, dynamic to our to our home life but, but we worked that through uh, and then even looking back on that period um, it's always important to take the lessons and and what did I learn from it it's just really really important now and I'm so glad to be able to say it, to to stop and breathe stop and understand what you're trying to to achieve really do step back and um, to fully understand what you're facing into uh, what are you trying? What are you trying to solve for? Always asking the question. Uh, you know, how are you helping your customers, and how does this help your customers? 
um, and, and of course, always balancing uh, your work life and home life too. Jumping forward from, I suppose, the initial months uh, um, on from March when, when, when COVID first emerged and to the start of the summer in 2020, the focus for us probably started to shift to the immediate future. So still a lot of uncertainty uh, in the market to contend with. Uh, one thing we did know was that the digital capability we'd introduced for payment breaks and some of the cash flow solution, so, solutions even uh, was really valued um, by our customers. Um, and this came through s some ongoing research that, that we, we, we commission uh, within the bank with our customers uh, to, in order to hear them, to listen to them and to be able to respond to their needs. Um, what I'd say to you is that pre-COVID, the appetite for uh, digital so applying for credit online or doing other things online and, and potentially pulling away from maybe the face-to-face the -face or traditional banking model um, ha had not been there. And very interestingly, as, as customers um, needed to adapt their own business model and needed a reach into the bank through a digital means or through an online um, uh, mechanism, th they began to, you know, we felt co business customers started to really... Um, uh, attune themselves to what the art of the possible when it comes to uh, to applying for credit and we were very very aware of the that and we were very very aware of the opportunity uh, that it had presented to us in terms of our operating model and, and how we deliver for our customers uh, in a speedily manner in a transparent manner in an, an efficient manner so all those key themes that kept coming through not just during the pandemic but even pre that were we were able to accelerate so I suppose we were very keenly aware of the the imminent emergence of, of the various government supports and um, particularly in the form of the report purposed SBCI funds and also the new government credit guarantee scheme and that had been got, getting a lot of press and it begged the question to us you know how do we continue to, to stay relevant uh, for our customers the partnership with the SBCI for, for the credit guarantee scheme just as an example afforded us a really unique opportunity um, to bring an innovative product and proposition to our customers at a time when our customers needed us to support them the most we also knew that if we were to deliver this uh, to our customers in a streamlined and hassle-free way, we needed to really completely rethink our operating model for this. And this was going to be really critical in order to continue to improve our customers' experience and ultimately make a positive difference to our business customers. So taking all the learnings, both good and bad, from the initial COVID response, we took a blank page approach uh, to map out a potential new customer journey all the time referencing back to the question, how will this proposition help our customers? Most importantly, from an organization point of view, we stood up a full group program to focus on delivering this solution at a pace, I suppose that we had not been truly familiar with in the past, but that in itself was a con considerable step forward. Um, and I suppose it really demonstrated the strong intent to be the first to market with the credit gr guarantee scheme, but also the fact that, you know, we recognize the opportunity in the market and we recognize the opportunity to really drive and adapt our model going forward. So what did that mean? Um, well, I suppose what we were able to, to deliver uh, for the credit guarantee scheme was an online journey that allowed our customers to initially inquire to our, our online uh, website. And it was a short inquiry to basically um, ascertain the suitability of customers for, for the product and proposition. Once the customer submitted the inqui inquiry on, online, uh, the bank received the inquiry and uh, we had rules in place that deemed the customer eligible or ineligible to apply for the scheme. We were able to automatically authenticate the customer's credentials. So through technology, through our modeling and through our da data sources, uh, no manual in intervention, we were able to validate and authenticate the customer and create a pre-populated application form. So the first time again, we're using our data, hugely conscious that many people um, listening in today will be all too familiar with the 20 odd page um, credit application that's paper uh, that's quite cumbersome uh, to complete and and all of a sudden we were now leveraging technology to actually not ask the customer uh, for data we already hold and actually um, provide them with an application form uh, through digital uh, 
pre-populated and that allowed the customer to complete uh, on their device or, or at home on, on, on their PC or, or laptop at a time that was convenient for them. Um, it, one of the other step changes with that, and again, I hope this resonates with, with many people um, listening in today, is that, you know, the, the paper trail with applying for credit, again, can be can be cumbersome and can be at often times very, very frustrating for our customers because of the over and back and, and flow of documentation. What we were able to do leveraging technology and as part of that application and pre-populated document was build in a, a capability that allowed the customer to upload all supporting material where it was required so that there was no um, paper trail or paper flow that many customers would 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 be would have been used to but 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 again a very frustrating process for many so the customer completed the application form through their device uploaded material and literally hit a button to send it back uh, to the bank so this they've, they've submitted their credit request um I suppose internally what we were able to do then was literally using our own internal capability was take that application form and pre-populate it into our credit systems. So there was no need for um, somebody taking a, a paper form or printing that form and keying it into a system. Many of our teams were working from home at this time. So again, we had to really, really rethink how, how we were gonna deliver this. And again, the efficiency that that brought meant that we were automatically creating the credit application form. Uh, we had introduced new uh, improvements in our automated credit decisioning capability that allowed more customers to be deemed in scope for an instant decision. And what that resulted in was 90% um, of, of credit applications that were deemed in scope uh, for automated decisioning got an approval. Um, and overall, our customer research, which we, we commission um, annually and, and 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 do that on a quarterly basis and um, through medallia our customers have told us that as a result of this proposition nine out of ten of them felt valued by the bank as a result of the experience that they went through so i suppose looking forward our business strategy now because of the opportunities and um, that, that that were created in the crisis is very much focused on how we evolve our credit operating model and our business proposition to deliver a market leading credit proposition that will meet and exceed our business customers' evolving needs and ensure that we as a bank remain relevant to our customers in what I can only describe as an era, era of competitive intensity and continued disruption. Continuous improvement in our innovation will also be dominant. Um, it's dominant now in the market. So how we enable our customers through constant uh, innovation and evolution will be our main source of competitive advantage as we go forward. So I'll pause there and um, thank you for listening and I look, look forward to you again, again during the panel discussion. Thank you very much. Thanks, Rob. Um, I think there are words that would probably resonate with everybody uh, on the call, uh, constant firefighting. But one thing I would encourage you to think about, I heard from family business many times, my suggestion to family business on the call, yes, you're working in your business, but you're working on your business. And there's a huge, huge difference. And it brings us on nicely to our next keynote speaker. Some of you may be aware of some of the programs that Enterprise Ireland offer. And again, for some of you joining from Northern Ireland, programs Invest Northern Ireland offer. Fantastic programs which are offered here by EI are Leadership for Growth, Management for Growth, Innovation for Growth, which are absolutely phenomenal, where it's taking people like Greg and AD, next generation, members of a family business and see how do we scale? How do we increase the business turnover by 40, 50%? How do we enter into new markets? How do we invest in new technologies? An integral part of the success of this program is the instruction from my colleague, Professor Brian Harney. Brian has won both national and international awards for his teaching in the areas of strategy. I'm delighted to welcome Brian here today to share his insights on strategy and strategy implementation for you, the family businesses of Ireland. So thank you very much for the introduction and the opportunity to present. Um, I think this is a fantastic theme in terms of taking a step back in order to take a step forward. I heard someone say recently that we need to face the past and walk backwards into the future. And I think that particularly holds for family firms when you think of, of the legacy, the values, the heritage that have shaped the firms they are today and how that can help frame and reframe 
uh, where they want to go tomorrow. So a lot of the literature you read on, on strategy and on planning will sort of imply a blank slate or a blank page, and I don't think that's the uh, appropriate um, approach. So what I wanted to do today was to um, present a small bit of context, and then I've been asked to speak to planning and, and, and delve into planning a bit further. But up front, I just wanted to highlight um, the, the context that we are in. And I, I'm a fan of uh, David McWilliams' term, pandeshin, and, and it really just captures that these are uncertain and uncharted terrain that we're in. Um, and with that comes the opportunity that we're a bit like an elastic band. We're being pushed back, pushed back. And as long as that elastic band doesn't break, there's a sense that things will pro propel and project forward um, in terms of economic growth. So, so it's distinguishing it from previous maybe crisis, particularly the financial crisis. By way of context, it's important as well. And we can make a distinction between uh, in the world wars, they talked about tents for physical traumas, so for physical injuries, and psychological tents for those that had witnessed trauma. And I think um, in the current, and given what we've gone through, I think we need to think about those psychological tents, uh, not only for our employees, but also for ourselves as, as owners, as managers, as leaders, uh, and creating that space or infrastructure or boundaries uh, whereby we can look after our own well-being. So that idea of a psychological tent, I think, is, is interesting and something that we're going to hear a lot more of uh, going forward. And then a final point about the current context, this idea of the Great Reset. So the World Economic Forum is talking about a Great Reset in terms of the way we, we think uh, and do things. And hopefully in terms of consumer sentiment, I think there will be uh, a more allegiance and sentiment and loyalty to our own indigenous uh, small firms, family-based firms that maybe we saw in the past. So those firms that have managed to survive and navigate the crisis, I think they will, and they hopefully will get the just deserves for, from that experience in terms of a changing sentiment. And we've already seen organizations do uh, fantastic things from turning alcohol into hand sanitizers, um, combi lift in terms of ventilators, fantastic things organizations, uh, Irish organizations have done, um, probably best captured by this example of the crossroads, uh, a pub turned into a digital hub for the post-COVID era, era. So a lot of our organizations have, have had to pivot. And I suppose part of this session is thinking about what we've learned from that experience and what we can leverage from that experience. Because we know from practice that strategy is a challenge on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and these are some quotes from um, some of the SMEs that we deal with in DCU. And I think the language is very telling when it comes to them talking about strategy, getting sucked back into the book, into growth, dragged back into the core, stuck in the day-to-day, -day. Uh, don't have time to work on the business, but we're manic in the business. And I think that reflects the fantastic report as well, produced by the Small Business Centre and, and Catherine Fardy. Um, and this highlighted the need for um, businesses to maybe step, step back and look for opportunities uh, to step back. And we know, and this is from um, Boston Consulting Group, we know that organizations certainly have been very good in terms of reactive mode, but we're perhaps seeing less um, in terms of the proactive nature, uh, preparing for recovery in terms of contingency planning, recession uh, recovery, um, sense checking value chains, and reimaginations in terms of where we want to go. But we do also know that those organizations that invest the time, the resources, and the thought processes um, into strategic direction, vision, clarity, and including employees in that, um, significantly outperform those organizations that don't. Those organizations that have clarity around, say, three clear objectives going forward, outperform those that have what, what someone calls a dog's dinner of, obje of objectives. So there is significance, importance, and value in uh, having that strategic process, that strategic thinking, the sense of, of strategic objectives. So in terms of planning specifically, and um, those of you might remember the Commodore 64 Sinclair sort of uh, chess games from, from the 80s, 
Um, and the idea is very much that a plan, and this is maybe why I don't like the word too much, is a sort of planning organization control. We can predict everything is rational. And I think we all know that we've moved far beyond that era to um, what's termed here coping with the fog of the future. So to uh, acknowledge, embrace and empower as a better way to deal with, with constant change. And, and when we look at plan, uh, a plan, I, I, I sort of think of not something an organization has, but something an organization does. And that to me is a very significant distinction. So we can talk about a plan as a document we put forward for funding to the bank. Um, we might do on an on a, a annual or five year basis. But I think what's really more important is to think about the activities of planning and, and how strategy is embedded into an organization. So. What I'm going to do is unpack, I suppose, some of the key letters in um, plan. So we're going to look at, at the process that I just talked about, litmus test, agility and navigation. And these, for me, are maybe a more holistic and appropriate way to consider uh, planning and strategy in family based and, and SME organizations. So first of all, in terms of, of the process of strategy uh, and planning, and we can think of, first of all, who's involved. Um, and I suppose the idea is that the mind only sees what the eyes, the eyes only see what the mind is prepared to comprehend. Uh, and by that, I mean, who's actually involved in the strategy process? Are, how are we sense checking our ideas? Um, we cannot see our own biases. So there's a suggestion that the diversity of the top team or the diversity of those that are having conversations about strategy should reflect the diversity of your client or customer base. Um, otherwise, there's a risk of this idea of an echo chamber, that we're all talking to a small amount of people about the, the similar things. Um, and even before we think of the problem, think of the questions that we want to ask about the information we have and, and how we got to that problem in the, in the first instance. So there's a sense of understanding the capability, the skill set, the viewpoints, the um, cognitive diversity, if you like, that needs to be at the table when we're discussing strategy uh, in the first instance. I like this idea, and it's linked to the, the echo chamber, of, of strategy as challenge. So it's not being number one or number two or succeeding or longevity. It's, it's about thinking about what is the biggest challenge confronting our business now and what, what are we going to do about it? Um, so having that coherent sort of response to a key challenge, because some of the strategy stuff you can read about, it, it doesn't really confront the elephant in the room, which is really where the, the value resides in terms of uh, navigating. Um, so Jim Barry from Barry Group talks about this idea of having an honesty attack, where he was involved in an education experience and it made him stand back and reflect on the way he was managing the business, the way the business was delivering value. So I think we should all think about ways that we can put ourselves in situations where we have honesty attacks, where we are challenged in terms of the way we've looked at ourselves or the way we've thought about things. So thinking about thinking, making judgments about our judgments. And how do we do this and how do we embed this? Well, I think thinking of strategy, rhythm and infrastructure. So strategy isn't something that should be relegated or left to, and if you think of all those quotes that we had previously, um, to a one day event, it should be something that's embedded in everything that we do. So how are we getting strategic insights? How are they coming from those that perhaps are dealing with customers or clients uh, to the, the top management team? How are we creating time for those strategic conversations? And a lot of what we do at DCU Business School is actually bringing people outside of their organization. So literally they can work on the business versus in the business. And a lot of organizations that come through our programs say, one thing we've done, which we found to have real value is retain that three hour session once a month where we dedicate the time to strategy. So some of the organizations have continued, if you like, the classes that we've delivered them in back in their own organizations. And it's about creating that space and time and, and, and not having even strategy session, sessions cut up in the, in the operational minute, it's, it's to give strategy the time that it deserves uh, and making that a rhythm of the organization part of everything that we do. So strategy is something that we do as much as something that we have. 
So it's just a way to think about the process. Um, in terms of planning then, um, the idea of the litmus test, uh, and we've all engaged in, uh, organisations have engaged in this experimentation over the last little while, but it, the idea of sort of learning fast, uh, failing fast, um, trying something new with a particular client or in a particular market uh, and getting the feedback to see how it works. Um, that involves a culture of learning how to learn. So sort of a psychological safety that it's okay for us to try something, it's okay for us to do, do things differently. Uh, and being conscious of opportunities to learn. So where is the best practice? Where maybe in different industries are people doing things really well? Uh, who are the disruptors on the sidelines? Who are the new startups? How do we learn about new technologies? Where is the blog, the information, the evidence base that we should be looking towards? Um, the A then, let's talk about agility. Uh, and I, I have here this sort of the idea of a, of a telescope and a microscope. And the idea is that one is projecting outwards, externally, sort of exploration, and one is focusing internally, if you like, on exploitation. And for us as organizations and then trying to manage in organizations, it's about balancing that exploitation of what we're good at and what we do with exploration around what we might be able to do in the future and for tomorrow. So that balance of uh, the microscope and the telescope in order to have that agility uh, akin to the Himalayan goats that you see there on the top right. And I think this is particularly important in the context of, of what we've learned from COVID and not letting those lessons pass. So what is it we can take forward in the new way the crisis has made us do things? What has it taught us about our go-to? What has it taught us about our critical clients, our key relationships, the people that we have? So I've seen organizations, uh, and we have it also in DCU, a team like a microscope team picking up what we've done really, really well, and also a telescope team looking to the future and seeing how we can manage. That in a smaller organizations might be just simply a splitting of time and it mightn't be dedicated roles for that task, but ma manifesting agility and embedding it into the organization. And a final point I would say is, is the N, if you like, is navigate. Be clear on our vision and our purpose and involve employees in that discussion and conversation. So here we see a sign for, for sour oranges. Um, do we know what we are and how we deliver value? Um, if you ask employees in your organization, what are the, the key things you do every day that most deliver strategy for the organization? Will they have a sense of what those priorities and activities are? Um, strategy then being as much what not to do as what to do. Um, making hard decisions, hard choices, getting rid of those vampire clients, deciding not to reopen. I saw an organization that, that focused as a restaurant not to reopen last Christmas, but instead focused on, on a new line of business in terms of manufacturing of, of sauces uh, to, to, as a supply, to supply into uh, other businesses. So making those hard decisions, not simply what to do, but what not to do. Um, where can we prune back and what has the crisis taught us about in terms of the key value add in our activities? And then I think finally, and I like this idea of humility. So we all remember this BBC uh, report from two, three years ago where the, the children came into the room and it was because it was the BBC, it was very formal and it was all over all the news. Uh, and now it's, it's common practice. And I think family business have been good at this anyway, and it comes naturally, but it's to okay and to be humble and to not know the answers and to ask questions of others. And that's humility mindset, if you like. I think is a pre-runner and a precursor to a growth mindset. So that's the idea very, very quickly, but hopefully just to give you some ideas in terms of unpacking planning, but the idea of strategy as a prototype and um, that we're continuously learning and developing and that we, as T.S. Eliot might suggest there, that we sort of come to the place we started with a fresh and renewed uh, understanding. And I think that's really where um, thinking about planning, embedded planning, and, and thinking of planning as activities and processes rather than documents and, and words. Um, and, and, and by considering it that way, it's perhaps something that we can embed more easily into the daily operation of our organizations to understand the high value add activities and understand the ways we can get feedback and learn from customers and also from employees. So thanks very much. Brian, really great words, uh, particularly like the, the comment from uh, Jim Barry about an honesty attack 
And for every one of us, it's the need to review, reflect, and I suppose plan uh, for what the future is going to look like for our family business. Folks, we have about 20 minutes now for a panel discussion. Um, I'm going to ask, uh, just to explain to who's going to be on our panel, we have our existing speakers, uh, uh, Greg, Rob, and Brian are, are going to join us. And I'd like to welcome uh, Aideen Carrick, who's the Operations Director of the Cantec Group. And also we're joined by Darren McDowell, who's a senior partner at Harbison Mulholland. Um, Harbison Mulholland is a Belfast-based accountancy firm and home of the Northern Irish Family Business Forum. Uh, we've been inundated with questions um, for the panel, and um, so many of you ask questions uh, in advance of, of the web webinar when you're registering. So I'd like to welcome the panel uh, and thank you for joining us. And uh, I'll kick off with some questions for you. Right, I'm going to come to you first, if that's okay. Um, I got a question which is very relevant um, for the world we live in. And Greg, I'm going to follow up with a, a comment or a question for you as well, if that's okay. We had a question with Family Business, Brian, saying, we have a strategy, um, but how often should you rewrite, review your, your strategic plan? Yeah, no, thanks, Eric. Uh, it's, it's a great question. Um, I think for me, and, and I think that, that the sentiment that I'd argue is that um, we should be thinking of, of strategy as a constant activity. So, so not something, not just focusing on, on, on the document uh, and the words, but thinking about the ways that we can understand trends happening in the external environment, uh, ways that we can reflect on our internal capabilities. So fantastic to see Cantec there talking about the way they pivoted and how they look to the external trends and how they listen to customers and um, voted themselves for Christmas, if you like, as turkeys and actually taking the strength and resilience to do that. Um, and also internally, as we're looking at a changing market, um, if you look at like an organization like Keelings, um, in the most traditional space you can think of, but when they reflected inwards and said, what are our key strengths? How can we build uh, and explore for the future, to use that sort of telescope analogy? Um, we're really good in terms of software provision. Um, so now we see during the pandemic that the launch of, of Keeling's knowledge uh, and, and the way they've shared knowledge. So um, certainly, yes, um, important to have it embedded down. But I think more important is embedding the strategy conversations so that they're happening all the time and it is embedded in the rhythm of the organization so um, strategy is too important to be left to an annual plan or a five-year plan it's actually something that we need to be discussing and having strategic conversations on a constant basis and um, so on a monthly weekly and having mechanisms that were open and learning from organizations around us from employees from customers and clients so we've got antenna uh, contextual intelligence, if you like, that we can see the changes in the world around us and, and jump before others do in terms of new opportunities. Greg, I might come to you on, on that one as well, just because, uh, and, and Aideen, I might come to you after that, because when you both came into this family business across the last 10 years, we speak about crises or periods of jolt in your family business. You've had the situation where, you know, with the rise of digitalization, people are using less paper. Then you've obviously had the COVID, people are not in the office space. So strategic planning for you and the need for a dynamism in your strategic plan must have been to the fore. How, how has that been? Yeah, very important, obviously. Um, and what we did, I mean, okay, the, the drivers of our business have, have been myself and my big sister, Dara Aideen, um, but also our business partner in, in, in Limerick, Dara Madden. Um, uh, we've been the drivers of the business, but we have a great team around us, which is very important. And what we did actually um, only in the last year is we brought two key members from that team up onto the board of directors. Um, because, um, and it's, it's, it's actually Brian who reminded me of why we did it um, when he spoke about echo chambers. Um, myself and Aideen are, are very similar actually in personality, believe it or not, and we tend to agree on most things. Um, so we realized that, you know, it can be quite dangerous to be in an echo chamber. Um, particularly when you're talking about strategy and, and you need to make the right decisions. Uh, Dara has been great as a, as a devil's advocate, if I suppose, if you like, our, our third business partner. But um, we took the decision to bring more people into that decision-making group um, and promoted two of our loyal colleagues up onto the board of directors. 
Um, and that's been very important for us. And we now have seven people on our board, um, all with an equal say, um, which is great. And it, it allows us to trash out the the pros and cons of of every decision that we make fully and comprehensively. And it um, ensures that our, our strategy is kept on point at all times, even when we got to pivot and pivot quickly. <laughs> Aiden, very similar personalities uh, to Greg, you were saying. Uh, would you agree or do you disagree? Yeah, well, yeah. we do tend to agree on a lot. Um, we, we're, we're a bit yin-yang as well in that we fit into the organisation differently. Greg is, is more focused on the, the vision and the direction, and I'm more focused on the operations in the back office. Um, but it, what, what interests me about this pivot um, is the comparison to what happened, say, in 2008. So in 2008, we had a similar crisis in that suddenly um, a lot of our customers went to the wall and we were we were in a position where um, we were losing business. And at that time, we, we made a completely different decision and we, we hunkered down and we focused on what we were good at and, and we did the opposite of pivoting or diversifying. Um, and, and that was the right decision at that time, whereas this is the right decision for this time. So, you know, from a strategy point of view, like you, you, you have to pick the right strategy for what, you know, for the problem that you're addressing. And, and I just think that it's a very interesting contrast between that, the, the, the last big crisis and this one. Can I just build on the comment you just said a second ago, maybe for Aideen or Greg? I've got a question in which is probably very relevant for a lot of people um, joining us today. Um, one of the questions said, um, we're a third generation family business, um, 100 million turnover. Can you maybe tell us a little bit about the importance of having a board? So maybe Greg, I might, might put that with you, please. The importance of having a board of directors uh, as a family business. Yeah, again, us, so there's, there's two of us, the brother and sister. Um, and then uh, again, I allude to the fact that we do tend to agree on most things. So having a board, is key in terms of all the diverse opinions that they bring to the table, um, which is again why we very consciously brought more people onto the board quite recently um, for a new business that we're running now, which has um, been diversified quite dramatically because of all the um, you know, external factors, the quite dramatic external factors, which we've had to deal with. Um, so having a board is very important. Um, while you know the whole blood is thicker than water element of my relationship with Aideen is key to our family business, um, we have we now have five other board members who are not part of the family, um, and that gives us a very, very diverse perspective, let's say, and and ensures that we make the right decisions more often than not, because we've got so many really good people adding to that decision-making process. Aideen, can I ask, how did you decide with the independent director, how did you decide who to bring on and what skill set they should have? Um, a lot of that was down to um, the people who had proved themselves in the business over the, over the previous years, the sort of dedication and loyalty that they'd shown, the how, how pivotal their roles were within the organization, the sort of knowledge bank that they held almost um, so they were people who understood our business completely and had a vision for it for the future um, so that really was key darren i bring you in uh, darren mcdowell of uh, harbison of holland uh, darren you're obviously working with family business uh, largely in, in the north um, can you give us your perspective on on boards and uh, the role and the importance of a board in a family business I think board structure is incredibly important and, and more so perhaps in a family business because the, the mixture between the family and the commercial activities is a constant battle. I mean, in, in Rob's presentation, even for AIB, even large organisations, this last 12 months has been very challenging for us all as, as we're managing video calls with our kids in the background and pets and whatever it happens to be. So I think it, it is important to have a good structure that deals with the commercial aspects of running a family business. And the clients that we deal with very often uh, look to having non-family board members, as Greg and Irene were uh, alluding to there, and also the importance of having non-executive directors. We have, we have seen through the Northern Ireland Family Business Forum, we've run a number of events 
that point out that having a non-executive director with a different perspective, again, to the day-to-day -day operations of the business is important. And particularly today, as we talk about things like strategy, that longer term vision and purpose can very often be something that a, a NED can bring to the table, particularly in a family business. Yeah, that brings me in nicely, Darren, to the next question is around strategy, because I think an important thing to say, the average tenure of a family business CEO is 23 years. So if we look in contrast to, say, a Fortune 500 firm or many of the listed firms in here in Ireland or in the UK, it could be four or five years. So family firms typically take a longer term view. Maybe it's big capital investment and particular technologies. Brian, I've got a question for you. How do you manage short term strategy and its incorporation to the longer term view of the family business? Well, I think, I think you make a really good point there, Eric, in terms of that longevity um, may becomes more naturally in terms of the, um, the family businesses. Um, and I, I think one thing as well, and you mentioned it in your introduction, is the significance of, of values and imprinting in, in a family business. And in a way, they can bridge the, the longer term focus in terms of why we exist, why we're here, what we're trying to do in terms of succession and value generation in, in all its forms, not just financial forms in terms of succession, contribution to the community, and what we need to do on, on, on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of, of, of our short-term strategy. Um, and I, I, th I think for many businesses, it, it's about sitting back and maybe just, or stepping back and maybe um, thinking about the designations of roles and people's time. So what percentage of time are we actually dedicating to the key issues that impact the future of the business versus what percentage of time are we dedicating to, to short-term problems? And with a lot of small businesses, which is natural, we see uh, owner managers getting sucked into dealing with the, the functional problem or, or the problem with the printer or the uh, going right down to the menu day. And, oh, that part isn't the best use of their time. Um, so managing the skill of, of delegation, and, and it links to Rob's point about structures and systems as well, is, is allowing the business to run not because of us, but in a way in spite of us. So having something that's there so that if you're on this call today or if you're in DCU Business School working on one of our exec ed programs, that you know the business is going to function without you that there's measures, there's metrics, there's systems, and um, there's values. Um, and I think that provides a, a seedbed of confidence and, and a foundation to then give a, a possibility for a longer term emphasis. Rob, I'm going to come to you a second a question, a really good question on digital. But just before I come to you, Rob, I'd just like to ask a question of either Aideen or Greg. One of the things you find about a family business is they're long term into the future but also they come with a past, they come with a history. So they could be 20, 30, 40, 50 years in existence. Myself and a, a colleague, Catherine Fahardy, are doing a piece of research around imprinting, which is where behaviors, norms, practices are imprinted into almost the psyche of the individual in the family business, which for a lot of part can be a good thing, you know, around quality, around teamwork, around the paternal cult, culture, absolutely fine. But my question, and probably it's a long-winded question probably to you, Greg, or, or Aideen, have you had a situation where maybe a practice from the previous generation you've had to change? Something that the previous generation did where you're like, that doesn't really fit with the world today. We need to change that. Greg, I'll come to you first, yeah. maybe, please. Sure. Yeah, I, <laughs> I think of my sister straight away. I think of you, Aideen. Um, so Aideen pretty much took over from our mum, you know, the running the running of the business, let's say, from a back office perspective. So, you know, as you mentioned at the start, we've experienced great growth in the last 10 years since we took over. Um, but that's been largely down to all of the systems and that Aileen has put in place has been quite phenomenal. The way the business runs now in comparison to 10 years ago. Uh, so there's been huge work. But with that has come um, a lot of control. And, and Aileen's challenge, I suppose, has been to let go of the levers of control gradually over, over those years. Um, but in fairness, I have to say that she's done a ph phenomenal job uh, quite recently in doing that and delegating a lot of those tasks down to some of the people who I've mentioned earlier who have who've been brought up um, to, the, to the board and also some of the people working for them. So while Aideen has you know, created this incredible structure, which has seen us through 
all of the challenges over the last 10 years, she's been able to step back and work very much more on the business than in the business, which is, is it's been great for me to see. Um, and the, pro the progression is, 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 a uh, is, is quite something. Well, thank big you very sister. much. Yeah, <laughs> thank you very much for your kind words. Um, yeah, I, 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 I am very much like my mother. Uh, we're a bit control freakish. We always we know best, you know. Um, and sure, uh, I could do it quicker. I could do it quicker than you, so I might as well just do it myself. But um, no, I, one of the my biggest learnings over the last couple of years has been about delegation and um, trusting people that you hire. You know, people that you come on board entrusting them to take responsibility for some of the tasks that need to be done and, and I would say that delegation is actually really key um, to to the growth of a business because you you can't the business can't get bigger than you if you do everything therefore you have to trust other people to do some of the tasks so that as you say you can step back and work on the business and and I think yeah I've, I've had a huge um, period of growth self personal growth over the last few years and i've suddenly learned that yeah it's a good thing to teach other people how to do stuff and why we do it that way and then give them the the power to to do it and to learn it and to work out maybe there's a better way than the way i thought and 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 so we're we're on that path and it's it's great it's working really well great to hear both you say working on the business uh, as opposed to just working in the business Robert, I've got to come to you. Um, the world of banking has been revolutionized probably in the last 10 years in particular right, through digital technologies. I can't even think about the last time I went into my, to my local bank. Um, so what advice do you have? I've got a question in and it's a, somebody saying they're almost anxious about moving into the digital era or in a quite a traditional industry. What advice do you have for a family business wanting to have a strategy and a big part of this strategy now is around digital? Yeah, th thanks, Eric. It's it's a very good question, um, and I, I suppose even reflecting on on what I spoke to this morning, it it was very focused on digitization and, and transformation. But but I suppose it was all predicated on the customer need for speed and and um, transparency. Um, you know, the 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 market itself was so uncertain that you know that certainty around kind of if I want a payment break, I've got it to give. A sense of um, uh, certainty within the business and managing the cash flow and, and and all of that. So I suppose like there's a there's always going to be a balance. So e even in banking, what I'd say is yes, um, you know, the importance of digitization uh, in in terms of certain elements will always be there. And and one of the interesting things that I didn't speak to earlier was that we recently commissioned some customer research. And it was really important because we've started on a transformation journey and we did that at the but we started that journey at the back end of 2020 and i suppose while nobody was openly saying it you know in in, in the group it, everyone was just thinking digital 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 um and we just felt we needed the voice of the customer in there and actually what is the the true customer need here and what does that look like so yes digital features in terms of if if i can apply for a credit facility alone and overdraft etc up to a certain level and, and it was typically up to you know 50 to 100 thousand and you could do it online seamlessly you know would that appeal to you versus the kind of traditional model of going into a branch or ringing your relationship manager or having a meeting with your relationship manager be it face to face or or, or through video etc and what really came through was the balance um, and the balance in the sense that yes if i can do it myself and know i get it great but i actually v really value having the discussion in terms of the experience or sector expertise that you might bring the value add piece so for me it's all it's it all has to be about balance um and i think there's a couple of things out there um even even we've been speaking with google uh, recently because um they're very much focused on on helping to support smes as well in terms of digitizing their business or or, or, or trying to get an online presence so it's not necessarily going to be a one size fits all uh, given the the multitude of sectors um, um in the economy but what i would say is start to think around what are you trying to achieve so from a digital perspective and to, to boil it right back down even having your shop window your website 
um, um, available and there um, for customers to see like you know what is my purpose as a business you know what are we trying to achieve here are we meeting customers needs telling your story um, and we have some work to do on our own website um, in, in, in that regard to make it more user friendly but I think as a good starting point in terms of actually really uh, maximizing your reach you know the website piece is is, is really really key um, so what I'd say as well is in terms of if, if people are looking to have a discussion or, or, or there's any aspect uh, of their business that they're looking to adapt, evolve, or, or you know, as a result of the opportunities or a result of the impact um, of, of, of the last um, 15 months, 16 months or so, uh, come and talk to us because there's other aspects, um, you know, outside of the digital arena from a strategic perspective that we also need to consider and, and businesses need to consider um, as well. And, and, and those areas are particularly, you know, sustainability, but also um, I would say the, the importance of the community presence. Um, and that is just as important um, now because I think I read somewhere recently some board fault uh, research to point to the fact that, you know, almost 50% 50, 50 of, of, of people don't plan to go away for a long period of time. So they, they, they may go for a short staycation, but during the summer months, that will create an opportunity for localized um, uh, ec economic activity as well. So again, summarize balance. If anyone's concerned, absolutely come and talk to us and um, we'd be delighted to, to help where we can. But um, start by looking at the website if it's fit for purpose. And actually, if you are a consumer yourself, going on to this website can you navigate it easily does it do what it says does it help me find what i'm looking for does it signpost me in, in the right direction really good advice rob thank you very much darren i'm going to come to you for the last question if possible please um i think in every one of our lives whether it's in a personal capacity or in, in the workplace life has changed and you know everything from how you order your morning coffee to you know restaurants in the evening or whatever it might be do you think the practices, Darren, that have been incorporated during the pandemic, are they here to stay or do you think things will return to somewhat normal practice after the pandemic? Thank, thank you. I, I think there will be a gradual flow back to what we were used to in some respect. Uh, although the good parts of what have happened has happened over the last 16 months might stay. I mean, there, in our own case, we have 50 in the team here and a number of them are working at home and some element of that works very well and may well continue. So I, I think that we will have a gradual re return to some things that were good, but it's also given us that opportunity to step back and think what is good and what can we embrace about the future. And just listening to everyone talk here today, the only, the only other thought that passes my mind is I think it was Peter Drucker that says, said culture eats strategy for breakfast. And as I listened to Greg and Aideen speaking, you know, you, you can hear that in how businesses have coped with the last 15, 16 months. And I am sure that family businesses in particular will continue to use those values that have established and, and seen them through the years and the challenges in the past as we push into the future, whatever that future may bring. Great words. Uh, thank you very much, Darren. Folks, we're just out of time now. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this experience. It's given you lots of thought how periods of crisis can be a time for reflection and review. Um, I'd like to thank uh, the sibling partnership of Greg and Aideen. Fantastic story of growth, resilience and adaptability. So congratulations to you on the success you've had and, and sincere thanks for joining us. Uh, I'd like to thank Rob for giving really solid sage advice around digitalization and how it can be relevant and applicable into the SME context. Brian, great words around strategy formulation, implementation. And Darren, again, really, really nice quote around culture and how culture eats strategy for breakfast. Folks, I hope you've enjoyed the, the conversation with us this morning. Uh, I'd like to thank our partners at AIB uh, for making all of this happen uh, and to you for, for joining us on it. Uh, join us in the future um, and we'll have uh, another interesting perspective on developing, maintaining and growing a multi-generational family business. Thank you very much and have a good day. Thank you.